Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Joe here on Wealth Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Hope you're doing well uh, on this uh, blurry, blustery day here in Washington, D.C. area. Uh, so, again, I hope, hope you had a great day. I hope you had a great week. And we have another Wealth Wednesday. And the focus here is going to talk about behind the scenes, the renovation process, demystify. We're going to talk about rehabs. How do you do rehabs? The good, the bad, the ugly. Um, you know, how's it, what does it take to, uh, to successfully complete the rehab? What are the steps associated with the rehab? Uh, that's what we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to do a deep dive as Um, because my understanding is that you want to do real estate investing and you want to uh, do some rehab. So I'm going to do a deep dive. Anyway, uh, I do have a, uh, you know, you see the, the ticker tape underneath. Uh, I do have a session uh, this Saturday, an event this Saturday. It's going to be a great event uh, at one of my students' uh, property here in Washington, D.C. So if you want to come to a, a real world property project, a rehab project where he is implementing uh, my birth strategy where he's bought a house for four bedrooms, two bath, and he's turning that into a six bedroom, four bath. How in the world do you take a four, two and turn that into a six, four? Well, if Uh, but yeah, we're going to go through all of that. How do I actually make this thing work? Um, the good, the bad, the ugly of a rehab. And so that's the subject. That's the focus on Saturday. Um, if, you know, if you want to attend, uh, please uh, register. You can go to my website, www.joasimo.com, www.joasimo.com. And you can register there. There is a fee, it's $49, just full disclosure, but we've got catered food. It's going to be a great event. My thing is that if you spend a dollar with me, my goal is to get back to you or give back to you at least two or three dollars back. So um, what you spend, you're going to gain multiple ways. There's also a networking component where you can network and meet with uh, like minded people as well. So that's the that's for Saturday. And uh, but today we're going to talk about, uh, you know, the the rehab process. So the focus of today is uh, behind the scenes. The renovation process demystified. Uh, behind the scenes, the renovation process demystified. That's what we're going to cover today. And as you can see, we're going to talk about the rehab in a deep dive uh, format. So uh, let's get going. So, uh, you know, the, I suppose the first question that you want to probably want to ask is, uh, you know, why is a thorough understanding of the renovation process essential for real estate investors? Why do you even need to know this? Um, with other people who want a house in great condition. So you're competing with homeowners and homeowners will always pay more than the investors. Uh, you know, most of the scenarios. So uh, that's the reason why if you can find houses where you don't have to compete with homeowners, you can sometimes get better deals. So that's the reason why you want to uh, at least consider rehab properties or properties that need work. So the journey to real estate investment is complex. It's, uh, it's not easy. Uh, and renovations is really a critical part of that process. Uh, and really it's a, success, a critical part for your success of your portfolio. You know, so with rehabs, obviously you can significantly enhance the value of the property. Uh, you can a a attract better quality tenants uh, if you're going to rent. And also you can increase your ROI return on investment uh, because a savvy investor. Uh, uh, it's it's important to plan uh it's important to budget and it's also important to overcome some challenges associated with the rehab process and that's what we're going to cover today 
And uh, so renovation is not, it's more than just fixing the property. It's really a strategic enhancement. Uh, the goal is to strategically improve the property in such a way that you get a better ROI, a return on investment. And uh, and that's what we're going to talk about. So whether you're flipping the houses, whether you're doing the buy and hold, whether you're doing the burr, this is where you want to learn and understand. So we're going to go through the good, the bad, the ugly, what works, what doesn't work, some of my experiences. And uh, hopefully it's going to be a lot of action items that I'm going to be able to share with you uh, that will help you on your, um, on, your, on your way. So we're going to demystify this process and breaking down the different stages into and providing you with actionable insights on how to actually do this the right way and so on. So uh, with that said and done, what are some of the action items so far? Well, uh, the foundations, uh, things like uh, study your trends in your area, where you want to invest. Uh, find out what renovations give you the, the largest return on investment, uh, what renovations, uh, you know, give you the best, most uh, value. Uh, if you get a chance to attend some workshops, uh, seminars, and where you can learn about this, and you want to network with experienced investors, ex And then you develop some experiences, you develop some, uh, you know, uh, successes, and then you can go on to larger projects. So that's the uh, backdrop. So let's get going. Let's talk about number one, which is, uh, let's have a look. It's assessing the property. So step one is you have to assess the property. Okay, so a wholesaler, the scenario is somebody calls you and say, hey, I got a great potential property at 123 Main Street somewhere. So with that lead, you're going to have to do some assessment. You're going to say, well, you know, is this something that's worthwhile for me? And so the question is, how do you effectively assess a property uh, for renovation potential? That's the first question that you're probably going to ask yourself. So, uh, you know, I said the first step is to. is quite a detailed evaluation uh the structural integrity of the property uh you're going to look for understanding the understanding your local market uh is there a demand for this product that hopefully you're trying to create and what you're going to get after the post renovation you know what's the value of the house is going to be what's the rent that you can get from so there's a lot quite a bit that goes into the assessment and but the goal is uh you know to identify not just the uh you know, the obvious issues, but also you want to anticipate potential and hidden uh, cost. You know, one, you know, one thing I've learned about doing a rehab is that, uh, you know, you start the rehab and things happen. You see stuff that you didn't want to see. And so there are hidden uh, costs. Uh, rehabs tend to cost more and they usually take longer than what you anticipate. But that's just the nature of the beast. So you have to make sure that you as part of your assessment, uh, you know, you uh, factor that all that stuff in. So, uh, you know, so what I do is to, you know, develop a comprehensive checklist uh, that includes things like uh, examining the foundation. Is there leaks? Uh, can you smell mold? Uh, what's the roof like? What's the electrical system like? What's the plumbing like? What's the AC? What are the other critical systems in the house? What are they like? Uh, that's all part of the assessment. And and also help you in terms of costing the repairs and so that way it'll help you uh, establish a, 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 a budget um, you know there are obviously things which you can see straight away there's also aesthetic things to consider as part of your assessment like the layout of the house uh, what's the lighting like, uh, the overall appeal of the property, the key factors that attract tenants and buyers. If you have an idea what your customers are looking for, then you should bring that to the property. And, uh, and so that will help you decide exactly what's necessary, what's needed, what's not needed. So there's uh, also on top of that, you're going to have to assess the local market where you are. 
uh, what are the property values, what are the rental rates, and what's the buyer preferences where you are. Uh, kind of spotty today. Uh, I don't know why, uh, but and it's so. Uh, apologize if you if you're having difficulty, uh, you know, following with me. But uh, please bear in mind. Please, please bear with me uh as we you know go through some of these technical challenges today uh so also you got to do some market research uh again on your budget your investment goals and things like that so what are the uh action items uh from section one uh is uh, assessing the property is develop a detailed property checklist and uh research your local area and uh you know to make sure that there's a need for rehab properties uh consult with architects or designers and so you can understand uh you know what a renovation potential is or even speak with home inspectors and contractors and uh, learn to identify some structural issues uh sometimes you go to a house you see a crack on the wall for example is that cosmetic or is that structural you go to a house you you smell mold is that structural or is that um, you know uh, cosmetic uh, you go to a house and um you know the the roof is uh, you know, the second floor, or third floor, the top of the house, there's a lot of water that's coming in. Uh, is that, you know, structural, i.e. a roof, or is that something that just needs a patch job? So, you know, it helps if you have an idea, uh, um, or if you don't, that's okay. You just find, associate yourself. Budgeting, uh, budgeting and financing. And uh, obviously you're gonna have to get the money from somewhere to do this rehab. Uh, so where's the money gonna come from? Uh, you know, budgeting and financing is the backbone uh, of the renovation project. Without money, it's not gonna happen. You need a realistic budget. Uh, you need to ad identify all the costs as much as possible uh, because an accurate budget helps you evaluate the feasibility of this project. And, uh, and it helps you secure in the necessary financing to do this project. So when creating the project, a uh, budget, sorry, it's really important to itemize costs, uh, including materials, labor, permits, and any other professional fees, uh, including contingency. You know, typically you want to set aside five, 10. out of money you got to factor in some uh over um you know uh contingency funds and uh and so on so uh, having that budget really minimizes risk of uh of failure and uh so financing the renovation is really a crucial step in this whole process uh there are various financing options for you as investors uh, you know, if you want to do a, a rehab project, I mean, there's traditional banks, there's commercial lenders, residential lenders, hard money lenders, private lenders. You know, there's lots of different sources. There are pros and cons with each, as we all know. And which one you select really depends on you, your situation, and uh, and so on. So that's something to consider. But there are definitely uh, funds available if you understand what the lenders are looking for, and uh, and you make sure you adhere to those requirements uh so again there are you know there are pros and cons uh there are good and bad of each of these different uh loan types uh but to a certain extent it's going to depend on your scope the project scope uh your credit worthiness you know what's your credit like a lot of lenders nowadays look for credit uh the project itself uh your your situation in terms of funds and reserves and uh an overall your overall investment strategy uh, these are things to consider when you decide what type of uh, funding you're going to be using. This is still being recorded, but anyway, I've used all types of different lenders and, and uh, financial sources 
whether it be residential, commercial, hard money, private money, and uh, and so on. So, um, so, but the thing is that uh, it's important to establish good relationships with lenders. Um, take the time to learn their business. Take the time to learn what they're looking for, and try to position yourself in such a way that uh, you know you become what I call bankable. And hopefully they can you're in a position whereby they'll borrow you the money because you've taken the time to understand what they look for, and hopefully you position yourself such that you can get that. So what are the action items? So what are the question, I suppose. Uh, what are some of the key considerations of budgeting and financing for renovation project? And I kind of talked about that. So the action items uh, for budgeting and uh, financing include things like uh, when you do a project, make sure you do a detailed uh, budget. Uh, research your financing options, uh, establish a contingency or reserves uh, to, un to handle unexpected uh, challenges and expenses. And also you want to consult with a financial advisor or somebody who can uh, help you in terms of, uh, you know, uh, locating the best financing sources uh, for your project and, uh, and so on. So uh, hopefully this is good. And uh, so we've done number two. Let's get down to number three, which is design and planning. Okay, so we bought the house, we financed it, we've done the assessment, we've done the design, we've done the planning, and now the next thing to do is to do the design and deep down to the design and the planning stages. So the question becomes, uh, how does effective design and planning contribute to the success of a renovation project? How does good planning and design uh, contribute to the overall success of the project? Well, this, you know, it's, it's key. Uh, design and planning are, you know, are where your uh, renovation vision really starts. You know, it takes stage. This is the stage where, you know, you identify, you know, what the end or the to be position is going to be uh, become. Uh, you're going to have to demonstrate some creativity. Uh, it's got to be cost effective, and it's also got to be, um, you know, uh, a situation whereby you get a return on your investment. So uh, planning involves things like uh, you know, design, uh, detailed blueprints. Uh, you want to establish timelines, uh, break it down the entire project into different stages. Uh, you want to work with experienced uh, architects, designers, uh, or designers, sorry, in creating the plans. And, uh, and you really want somebody who's, um, you know, is creative, somebody who's got good relationships with the folks down at the county or the permit office because they understand what the uh, government officials are looking for. And so hopefully they can include all those things in the initial drawing or initial design. So you, you such that it doesn't get rejected and kicked back out once it gets submitted. So you want to make uh, sure that the, the, the project that you're doing, it kind of aligns with your business or your budget and investment goals. Because a well-planned design uh, takes into account lots of different things in terms of the target customer, target demographic you're looking for. Uh, for, for example, I do a lot of Section 8, so I tend to cater to families. And the families I choose for are very particular about the location where they live. Uh, uh, they want a house that's functional design. Uh, they like the same thing that you like, a nice house, a decent area and uh, a nice functional flowing design and that's what they like and that's what i try to give them uh, because i'm catering to families obviously if you're catering to individuals professionals for example uh they all look for different things young professionals things like modern amenities or technology uh integration within their unit i mean that's important to them it may not be so important for the people who i rent to uh so the other thing is that it's important that you're probably going to need permits uh, depending on the scope of your project. Some projects are larger than others, and so therefore they may require permits. And there are lots of different types of permits. And uh, the permits are typically issued by the local government and uh, with a permit office. So, uh, you know, it's it's important to, to understand how it works where you are. Uh, try to develop relationships. Uh, if you don't have time, then maybe work with an architect or an architectural designer. Uh, who can get it through the permit process uh, smoothly, efficiently, without a whole lot of drama. So what are some of the action items in terms of the design and planning? Uh, collaborate with other people, designers. 
uh, align, uh, you know, understand what market demand is and make sure that uh, you are uh, attuned to that. Uh, when you're going to do a project, make sure you have the necessary permits and you understand the local building codes. And then finally, uh, you want to create a detailed timeline. And, uh, and once you start the project, you want to monitor progress on a regular basis. So uh, with that said and done, we're going to go down to, if you've got some questions, please put them in the chat box. And uh, I will try my best in about uh, 10, 15 minutes to go through those questions. And you can pick my brain. You can ask me all the questions you want, whether it's Section 8 related, anything to the real estate investing. Uh, I'll give you my shot in terms of trying to answer them for you. Okay, so enter your questions in the chat box and I'll get to them shortly. Uh, section 5. Uh, step five is navigating permits and regulations. Uh, as I said, uh, depending on the scope of your project, you may or may not need permits. My project typically does require per permits. And so the question becomes, um, you know, why are permits and regulations critical in the renovation process and how can you navigate them effectively? So why do we need permits and why are they so important and how do you navigate that process? So that's what we're going to cover right now. So uh navigating permits uh is critical you know it's uh you know you want to be sure you're compliant with local regulations safety health and safety uh things and, and uh, these are all kind of overseen by the local uh, permit office uh the inspections office um you know because they have a a, a duty to make sure that uh you know all properties meet certain minimum requirements in terms of health and safety and safety and, and, and things like that. Uh, if not, then you could be hit with fines. Uh, you could be hit with what we call stop work orders, uh, which can be very, very expensive to, um, to take care of. So the, the process begins with understanding your local building codes, which can vary significantly from mun municipality to another. And uh, these codes dictate everything from structural uh, requirements uh, electrical codes, plumbing codes, HVAC codes, building codes, and uh, you're going to need a. You may need permits, which means that you're going to have to go through a time-consuming process to, uh, you know, to get the necessary approvals and to make sure that you have the paperwork in place to make sure you schedule and conduct inspections. It's not easy, but uh, it is what it is. While it may be cumbersome to uh, this step, uh, it's a, it's all important to, you know, to protect yourself that uh, you know you have the right permits, you have the right inspections, uh, and therefore you're able to, to um, you know, protect yourself really. So uh, yeah, that's, so you know, some some cases, some of your municipalities, if it's very, very complicated, uh, you can hire third parties, what they call expediters, who are able to, um, you know, navigate the bureaucracy and get your drawings and, uh, you know, stuff approved. So what are some of the action items associated with this? Um, familiarize yourself with you know, local building codes and regulations. Uh, allocate time resource for obtaining necessary permits in your design. Consider hiring a professional to help you with the per permit process. And keep thorough records uh, on permits and inspections. So that's number four. And then five, well, we're gonna, maybe we've got five. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, we're going to talk about the actual renovation itself. Uh, so the question then becomes, uh, you know, what are the best practices for managing the renovation uh, to ensure quality and timeliness? So uh, that's so. Okay, at this point, we, you know, you've 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 got the permits. You're now ready to start working. So the actual renovation itself uh, requires planning and, and, and preparations. Obviously, um, you know, it requires you to stay on track with uh, time, budget. Uh, quality. So this obviously involves selecting the right contractors, and that's a whole other discussion itself. What is the right contractor? Clear lines of communication is exactly very, very important. And I feel at least for the first one, maintain some kind of hands-on approach uh, so that you can learn and hopefully you can establish a rapport with your contractor. Um, you know, because choosing the right contractor it really makes a huge difference. And uh, it could be the reason why your project was successful or it failed. And I've had all types of uh, contractors, uh, contracts from heaven, contracts from hell, and everywhere between. Uh, so vetting potential co uh, contracts is really important. 
it's based on establishing criteria um you know and look at their uh, do some research on the reputation their track record other projects that they've done they've done and maybe go visit some of them uh, because once you've uh, assembled your team, uh, you can set expectations and uh, you can agree on timelines and then you can get the work done. So, you know, once the project starts, regular communication is absolutely key. You can check in on a regular basis or you can meet with them off site. Uh, I, I recommend uh, you meet on site initially. Uh, on a regular basis, that makes time, that makes sense for both you and the contractor. And it's also, uh, once you start a project, it's, all, it's also important to understand that standing issues and, uh, and try to work with your contractor. Uh, otherwise, you could go the other way and then you go to arguments and you fighting and then next thing you know they either quit the job quit the project or you get or they fight or you fire them which you don't want to do because firing contractors is very time consuming and it's very very rare that you actually save any money so what are some of the action items here in terms of the renovations carefully select and vet your contractors uh, based on lots of different things including experience and also their reputation uh, establish clear communications channels and regular check-ins and conduct regular, you know, on-site. That will come on these projects. And then finally, uh, setbacks, you know, nothing goes smoothly. Sometimes things happen. It is what it is. That's just the nature of what you say. So the question becomes, how can you effectively handle and overcome common renovation setbacks? What are some of these common renovation setbacks and how do we handle some of these things? So what do we do? So setbacks in a renovation process is it's going to happen. It's just the nature of the beast. You're going to have cost overruns. You're going to have issues with your contractors. You're going to have delays. You're going to have maybe unexpected structural problems. I mean, it, these things all happen. The key to overcoming these challenges, though, is preparation, flexibility, and uh, a really a problem-solving mindset. You know, when you uh, come across a problem, uh, try to be in solution mode, and uh, you can work with your contractor, hopefully, uh, in such a way that you can overcome some of these challenges and problems. Uh, but being prepared for setbacks involves having a contingency plan. So have a contingency plans and a flexible budget just in case, um, you know, these delays are costing, costing you money. Uh, so the action items for uh, the uh, setbacks, things like develop contingency plans, maintain a flexible budget and timeline, and uh, cultivate a, a network of, of resources for quick problem solving solutions. And then finally, conclusion. Whoa! Uh, renovating properties is both complex and can be very rewarding if, if you've got uh, good contracts, especially. Uh, but it could be a, a nightmare uh, if you don't have certain things in place. Uh, so, from assessing, uh, planning, and executing and overcoming challenges, you know, these are things that you're going to have to go through. So, hopefully, I, I try to share with you my experiences having done this so many times. Uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, some of the things to be aware of. And hopefully this has been helpful. And uh, so I think I'm going to wrap it up now and then go to Q&A. But don't forget, we do have an event on Saturday, December the 16th, uh, between 11 and 1. Uh, one of my uh, students' rental properties here in Washington, D.C. It's going to be a great session where we're going to do a deep, deep, deep dive into the acquisition renovation process. What does it take uh, to do this successfully? You'll get a chance to go to the property itself where they are turning a four bedroom, two bath into a six bedroom, four bath, four, two to six, four. So how do you do that? Well, come on Saturday and find out. We're going to have catered food. There's some nice refreshments there. So please join, bring your empty stomachs uh, because there's going to be food there for, for, for really nice food based on last time. Really, really nice food. 
And uh, it's we had a great time in the last session. So I'm looking forward to this one. You really do need to come. Um, again, December the 16th, uh, between 11 and 1. You can register at my website, www.joasamoa.com, uh, www.joasamoa.com. Or if you're on my email list or uh, social media list, you should have got some posts and some emails. You can register via the links there. It's going to be a good session in Washington, D.C. Uh, it gives a great chance to pick my brain. And on top of that, we have networking so you can meet with like minded people, investors out there who are trying to, you know, become financially independent, just like what we're all trying to do. Uh, you're going to have those people in the audience so you can network with like minded people. It's going to be a great session. So please join me on Saturday. You can pick my brain and ask me all the questions you want on real estate investing. And uh, between 11 and 1 on Saturday uh, in Washington, D.C., register. Uh, at my website, www.joasmo.com. Or you can go on Instagram and Facebook, uh, where I've had some posts in the bios uh, where you can press to uh, to register. Uh, there is a fee. It's $49, uh, full disclosure. And uh, But my goal is whenever I do an event, if you spend a dollar with me, my goal is to return at least two to three times that in terms of content information and just an overall experience. So I think you're going to love uh, Saturday's session. It's going to be a good one. And uh, so please, I look forward to seeing you on Saturday between 11 and 1 in Washington, D.C. And don't forget to register. And I'll see you there. So let's get down to the Q&A. If you've got some questions, please put them in the chat box. And again, if you want to shoot me an email, you can email me at joe at joeasimo.com. Joe at joeasimo.com. So with that said and done, my friend. And I'm going to go to the Q&A part and see what's going on. Let's have a look. Uh, let's have a look. Oh, Alvin. Hey, Alvin. Uh, a, co-worked, a, co-worked and I, a co-worker and I, I suppose, signed up for the event on Saturday, but neither of us received the address for the property. Yes, you'll get that 24 hours before the event. Uh, that should be on the – when you signed up, we say we're going to give you the uh, address. Uh, so you'll get an email uh, probably – Friday or sometime late Thursday with the address of the property in Washington, D.C. So for all those that are registered, you'll get an email uh, probably Thursday evening or Friday uh, giving you the address of the property. It's in uh, the Tacoma neighborhood of Washington, D.C., the northeast part. And uh, so I look forward to seeing you on Saturday, Alvin, and your coworker. Hope all is well with you. And uh, we haven't spoke for a little while, so I look forward to uh, catching up with you on saturday good evening dr j thank you for sharing your experience with us no problem thank you go get lobster and uh let's have a look what property types do you have more of in your portfolio uh i heard single family appreciate more than duplexes triplexes and fourplexes have you found that to be the case in your experience uh most in fact all my properties are either single family homes um uh, you know what I mean by single family is it could be a row house, it could be a detached, it could be a semi-detached, a uh, townhouse. Um, you know, I don't usually own, I don't own any uh, apartment buildings. Uh, I've got a couple of houses which are very, very large, and therefore we may duplex without them. So we may rent the basement uh, as a separate unit. But it's uh, technically it's a single family house. It's not a multifamily. Uh, well, I suppose technically it's a, it's a multifamily, but uh, it's really a single family house, uh, a large single family house that we've made into um, uh, maybe rent the basement out. So uh, that's just what I've been used to. Uh, I enjoy it. I understand how it works. Uh, single family houses, if I need to sell them, typically there are more people looking to buy single family houses. So if you need to exit, uh, you know, it's easier than, say, an apartment building where you know typically the people that buy apartment buildings tend to be investors uh so your pool of buyers is much 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 greater uh with single families uh than multifamily but there are pros and cons uh you know with single family and multifamily uh the big con with a single family is that if somebody leaves you got no income coming in so uh you know, whereas the multifamily, if someone leaves, you still got income from the other units. So that's one of the big downturns and uh, problems with single families. Uh, how do I get around that? I try to get tenants who stay a long time. 
um, you know, you know my story. I minimize those turnover costs, and therefore the um, uh, the uh, income that comes in, the cash flow stays in my pocket, uh, as opposed to losing it through uh, turnover. Do tenants in single family properties stay longer than other types? Of, in my experience, yes. Uh, I tend to, uh, as I said, cater to uh, people voucher holders with three, four, five, six bedroom vouchers, which generally have uh, children. So children tend to be uh, what I call an anchor. Uh, you know, they tend to provide stability for the parents. So the parents don't usually like hopping around when they have children in place. So the kids are, are almost like, are like an anchor. It keeps them there. And parents don't usually want to yank their kids out of school, uh, neighborhood, uh, especially once they've got, they like it and made friends and uh and so on so uh, my longest tenants 26 years uh, i think i'm averaging seven years now for all my tenants across my portfolio so yeah i i you know and these rents are three four five six thousand dollars so uh it's very hard to get somebody who's paying three four five six thousand dollars to stay a long time three four five ten years uh if it's a market renter because they're gonna say this is crazy let's go buy our own house so that's the downside that you have um you know with multifamily where you cater to younger people or uh, people with smaller families uh i tend to cater to to families and uh and have the houses as well so again there are pros and cons i'm not saying that my way is the best way or the highway uh it's just one way i've had a lot of success uh, uh doing that uh Get lobster. You're asking a lot of questions today, sir. Uh, learn that it's good practice to verify contractors' insurance and workers' comps, even for small jobs. Have you found this to be practical in your experience? Uh, yes and no. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, what I do is uh, I have some contractors who I use. I've used them for the last, what, 10, 8, 10 years. And they're really, really good. They know what they're doing. They have uh, licenses. They have insurance. And uh, you know they do great work, and they suggest that you do, do do some due diligence on your contractors before you hire them, and make sure they have the right paperwork in place. Make sure you get some references. Make sure you check their work, and uh, and hopefully uh, you get the right ones because the wrong ones can be a pain. It can be a nightmare. It could be a make or break. Uh, I've had guys show up drunk at my rehabs. Guys that say they're going to come, they don't show up. Guys who take your money, you never see them again. Oh, I've had them all. And uh, so screening your contracts becomes really, really important. And uh, maybe I'll do a session just on that alone. So, yes, you want to do some due diligence on the contractors to make sure they're legit, get some references, go see their jobs, check their paperwork on all those different things. Okay. Get lobster again. Oh, my goodness, sir. You're hogging. Your in Zillow. What are the advantages of utilizing those filters? Or may they simply be a waste of one's time to be looking at those listings? So if a project is under contract, it means that uh, technically the seller has accepted a buyer's offer. And it hasn't got to closing yet. I mean, things happen. Uh, the, the contract may fall apart for various reasons. The buyer can't get financing. The home inspection uh you know, uncovers a lot of things that uh, you didn't want to uncover. And uh, the seller's, the buyer's financing may fall through. So there's lots of different ways uh, where contractors, uh, contracts fall through. And so uh, if it's pending or under contract listing, some sellers are still open to showing the property. But then you have to decide whether it's worth it. And because technically they've already accepted somebody else's offer. And so you, you, you know, you definitely don't want to pull your hopes and dreams over it uh, because they may be compelled to go with the other offer, which means that you're going to get disappointed. Uh, so you can keep them in your filter. 
or you can take them out. It's really up to you. Uh, you know, there are pros and cons as usual with either of those, those options. Uh, you can get your hopes high and they'd be severely disappointed because they've already accepted somebody else's contract. But then again, that contract could It's up to you if you want to uh, include us in uh, Get Lobe. Uh, looking forward to seeing everyone on Saturday. I'm sure. Look forward to seeing you, Johnny. I've seen you in a while. Hope all is well on your side. And uh, hopefully we can catch up and, uh, you know, see what's going on. Okay. Get Lobe sure again. Is there an easy way to identify neighborhoods that are more owner-occupied since there seems to be more benefits in buying in such neighborhoods? Uh, again, this is where your local knowledge comes in. So wherever you uh, live, Get Lobster, uh, I think you're in Phoenix, I think. Uh, there are people there that understand the market. Uh, they understand the different neighborhoods. They understand the, the zip codes. And so uh, I generally try to buy in. in uh, Local knowledge becomes really, really important. Now, if you don't have that local knowledge yourself, there are other people that have it. Uh, people like real estate agents, brokers, property management companies. Uh, you know, there's lots of people who have that local, you know, uh, appraisers uh, who understand in neighborhoods which ones are residential, which ones are commercial, which ones are whatever. And uh, I would definitely have conversations with people who are who are more knowledgeable about your local market. To, to, to help you to make sure that you don't buy in the wrong area and, or buy the wrong property. Um, because once you've bought it, you're kind of stuck with it and, uh, and so on. Good questions. Uh, DCC, uh, Dr. Joe is showing us one tool of his success, consistency. He shows up each week to engage us, no matter the live audience size. Thank you from Houston. Yeah, I'm trying to, uh, you know, I mean, if, you know, if no one shows up, I'm still going to be here. Uh, I enjoy, I want to help you. I want to provide quality content, quality information. I want to, you know, encourage you, motivate you to actually go out there and do this stuff. So uh, I enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy sharing knowledge. I enjoy doing the research. I spent quite a bit of time researching uh, in order to prepare for this meeting, this uh, Wealth Wednesday every week. So it's a, it's a sacrifice on my part, but that's okay. I'm not looking for... Fame and glory is just something I do to encourage you. It's free, and hopefully it'll give you the necessary motivation to go out there and pull the trigger and make it happen. Uh, Mr. Joe is – Dr. Joe is showing us one – okay, I think – thank you. Okay, you, I think I've just done that one. Uh, well, again, thanks for kudos, DCC. I appreciate it. Uh, get lobster. Thank you so much for your patience with answering my many questions. Yeah, yeah, a lot of questions this uh, today, uh, get lobster, so that's all good. Uh, again, if you've got some questions, please put them in the chat box and I will try to get to them very, very shortly. We've got about 10, 15 minutes left. Uh, I've had a long, long, long day today, so I may wrap it up a little early, but if you've got some questions, put them in the chat box and I will try my best to get to them, um, you know, and so on. So all the rave from the multifamily investors is that Joining partners for multifamily is a bigger ROI opportunity versus single family. That may be tr true. Which one is better way to build a real estate portfolio? Again, it's all personal preference. There are pros and cons with either uh, DCC. There are guys or uh, women who are very, very successful multifamily, larger, small, mid, large uh, uh, multifamily buildings. I mean, who am I to say they're wrong? Uh, it works for them. And uh, I do single families. It works for me. Uh, single families, a lot more, uh, you know, there are pros and cons. So which one works for you is up to you. Um, I just prefer single families. And I understand single family business model. And uh, I am making the single family business model work for me. I do a lot of Section 8. Uh, without Section 8, hey, it's tough, especially if you're in a, a jurisdiction where it's hard to get tenants out uh, because with Section 8, at least uh, if they don't pay you, 
you're still getting uh, at least the government's portion of the rent and uh yeah so you kind of what we call cap the you know cap the downside uh and uh the upside is much much more uh you know lucrative because people tend to stay longer uh in fact i'll do a session in the next week or two where one of my tenants just left the house uh in washington dc i mean she was there for 10 years and uh, during that time the property is appreciating you know, significantly and uh i didn't do the heavy lifting time did the heavy lifting so i just bought the house got a good, great tenant and just nurture and manage that relationship and now she's left and the uh, property is appreciating value now i have to decide what i'm going to do with it do i keep it and re-rent it or do i sell it and cash out and then do other things so that's the dilemma i have uh definitely you know we'll do a session on that one uh you know in the, in the in the very near future so uh with that saying this i have 746 747 so i'm gonna wrap it up now because I'm, I'm just kind of tired i've had a long day uh again if you uh uh on saturday uh between 11 and 1 i do have an event uh please if you're in the dc area come along and join us uh, it's gonna be a great session it's all about rehabs uh we're going behind the scenes uh you're going to be able to actually see a rehab that i'm associated with uh a project which one of my students just purchased purchased recently uh where he's turning a four bedroom two bath house into a six bedroom four bath house and so you got to see that one it's a great project you know he's doing fantastic very impressed and uh he's decided he wants to pull the trigger he's deciding he's going to make it happen and I'm helping him on his journey. Uh, and so far, everything is running relatively smoothly. And uh, But he's enjoying the experience. And he's learned a lot, learned a lot, or learning a lot. And so hopefully, he'll be able to you know, acquire more properties uh, after this one. So again, my friends, I'm going to wrap it up now. Uh, thanks for joining me on Wealth Wednesday this week. And uh, we had a good time. And uh, what's it called? Uh, hopefully, uh, I'll see you on Saturday. Let's, oh, I think we've got one more question here. Yes, we wanted to hear your motivations for preferring single families. Thank you for that response. Yeah, I like single families. Um, but, you know, that's me. And other people prefer multifamily. And that's them as well. So the grass is always greener on the other side, as they say, until you get there. And it's still a lot of hard work. Uh, and so either whichever one you choose is not easy. It's still hard work and it's still trials and tribulations that you're going to experience. But hopefully I can help you, encourage you on your journey. So hopefully it'll be a, a road that is uh, you're excited to, to travel. Okay, my friends, that's it. Uh, it's now 6.49, 6.50. So I'm just going to wrap it up and call it a day. I'll see you on Saturday, hopefully. Don't forget to register at www.joeassamoy.com or you can register via social media, uh, you know, and so on. So I'll see you on Saturday between 11 and 1. Have yourself a wonderful evening. Take care, guys. Bye for now.